Hi, my name is Ryan Pitt, and uh, I'm going to talk to you guys today about the supply chain analysis of H&M. Um, joining me will be Jeff Clausen um, and Matt Matiski. So, so this is a quick background on H&M's profile. Uh, they're a multinational retailer based in Sweden. Um, they were established in 1955. Uh, today, they have 3,132 stores in 53 markets. They provide basic clothing and fashion um, to a wide uh, variety of consumers, uh, mostly ranging from 1830, 18 to 30, uh, but they sell it to men, uh, women, uh, teenagers, and kids. Uh, they also sell shoes, accessories, cosmetics, um, as well as home decor. Uh, their business concept combines fashion uh, and quality at the best price, um, and they have a high focus on sustainability uh, built into their supply chain. Um, so, this, so this is their motivation. Um, and I, I kind of use uh, Simon Sinek's idea of starting with why uh, to explain their uh, motives, uh, just because H&M uh, does a good job of that. Um, so many companies uh, base their business uh, solely on the products that they sell, uh, what they sell. Um, as Simon Sinek describes in his book, um, the best way to look at how a business operates is starting with why they operate, why, what is their purpose. Uh, and H&M does a good job of basing their products off of their purpose. Um, so instead of saying that they sell uh, fashionable clothing, uh, they highlight their vision of running their operations in a way that is economically socially and environmentally uh, sustainable, uh, making purpose more important than the products that they actually sell. Uh, this allows consumers to identify with H&M's brand um, and idea, um, and their vision statement is reiterated up there. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is kind of their business concept. We, I brought this up on the first slide, but it's uh, highlighting the point that they're cost leadership um, and differentiation. Um, their business concept, um, and this is their words, to us, design, quality, and sustainability are not a question of price. We should always offer inspiring fashion um, with unbeatable value for money. Um, so the fashion industry, um, this is just general trends in the industry. Um, Industry is characterized by short life cycles, short selling seasons, um, and long replenishment times, um, which affects the supply chain of many of the other uh, competitors in the industry. Um, consumers' tastes change quickly and they vary, uh, which makes forecasting uh, difficult. Uh, the industry operates uh, in a way that um, companies have to differentiate themselves on either a different difference in price points or the quality of uh, their product. And one of, the, one of the biggest things that we have seen um, in the industry is that many co um, companies have moved production to developing nations um, in order to cut costs. Um, however, uh, this outsourcing strategy of moving to developing nations uh, does not necessarily uh, deliver the best idea um, due to higher lead times higher transportation costs, as we kind of talked about in our class. Um, as you'll see um, later on, there's a time and a place um, for those higher lead times um, if you're going to develop in Asia, um, or um, in H&M's case, uh, they've moved some of their production to Europe. Uh, so H&M is in the fast fashion uh, business. Uh, this is a growing market. Um, what fast fashion does is quickly mimics the trends of many of the designers out there um, taking runway ideas um, and making them into affordable low price items available to the mass market. Um, the characteristics of fast fashion, um, they typically sell to people under 40 uh, that have affordable prices with quick response to uh, market uh, trends. And the assortment has high turnover uh, right here, Forever 21, uh, Peacocks, 
and Zara um, are three competitors uh, to H&M that are in this fast fashion uh, industry. So here's a quick overview of the supply chain. Um, I'm going to be talking about design, uh, forecasting, and talking about the quick response model that H&M uh, has in place. Um, their production offices and how those production offices um, allow H&M to collaborate with its suppliers. Um, next we'll talk about transportation, uh, the warehouses that they have, um, the stores, and finally reverse logistics, what they do um, to bring uh, products back. So design, um, as with every fashion company, uh, design is essential to success. Um, they've been able to hire successful designers and have uh, led a lot of collaborations. Um, Carl Lagerfeld is uh, one of the guys that they brought in. Uh, he's the head designer and creative director of Chanel. And most recently, they had a collaboration with Albert Wang. He's a California designer. Also, uh, they were able to partner with Versace um, in 2011. However, when, when looking at their design, they always stay to their core values of uh, having a high sense of fashion by looking at quality, price, and making sure that they align with sustainability. Um, some of the stuff with their design um, is that they have moved away from two seasonal collection of designing um, and moved to constantly uh, turning over uh, their, their lines. Um, this uh, allows the consumers to have more things to purchase. Um, they've also, with this, they've shortened their product development life cycle of up to six times. So, um, just something to talk about before we look at forecasting um, with H&M. Uh, the fashion industry um, has very unfavorable things to forecasting uh, within the industry. Um, there's high impulse purchase, high impulse purchasing, um, high volatility in the market, and it's difficult to know what is gonna be a hit um, and which product is actually gonna do well. Um, so forecasting is something that is very difficult for fashion. Um, so H&M does forecast, however, they put less emphasis on it um, as uh, many other companies would. Um, and this is also due to the short selling seasons, uh, levels of uncertainty, and lack of historical uh, data for the trendy products. They don't know if it's going to be a hit. Um, and so with their own forecasting, they utilize uh, demand forecasting companies, such as Worth Global, um, style network limited to um, make uh, forecasting efforts and this is kind of more for a, a more macro approach more macro view of what's going on in the industry um, <clears throat> so something that they highlight um, more is their agile supply chain and this lets them move to changes in demand um, so with this um, they have a quick response supply chain um, a quick response supply chain uh, produces goods only when there's enough evidence for demand. Um, and this proves effective in this constantly changing uh, industry. It allows retailers to avoid stockouts uh, and su continually cycling uh, new products. Uh, the main trade-off uh, is balancing these higher costs of quick response, um, getting the products out as soon as they can, uh, paying for uh, faster transport and as Matt will talk about um, how they move fashion products to Europe um, <clears throat> but this also allows them to um, avoid high exposure to excess inventory and reduce uh, finished goods in that uh, inventory uh, chain um, so with this they're actually able to uh, create manufacture uh, and deliver products in as little as three to six weeks. And um, I will pass this on, but uh, the ability to, uh, for this agility, agile supply chain to work is based off the technology uh, production offices and how their supply chain is vertically integrated um, with their suppliers, their transport. 
and such. So I'm going to pass this on to Joe. So um, now we're going to talk about the technology that H&M has in place in their um, supply chain. So each store is linked to a global uh, ERP system, Enterprise Res Resource Planning System, and uh, it delivers uh, key up-to-date information uh, to their whole supply chain. Uh, the information goes to uh, headquarters, uh, the warehouses, production offices, H&M um, also shares this information with the suppliers, and this helps um, keeping up with the latest fashion trends. And uh, sharing, this, sharing this ERP system information with uh, their internal workings, they are able to uh, better forecast because they have this, this uh, short-term historical data on a, on a recent trend, and it, it allows them to better forecast how it will sell or if they need to change trends and such. Their uniform IT platform allows the company to react quickly to uh, new trends and it allows them to avoid overstocking uh, trends that aren't working as well. Uh, production offices. So H&M uh, has uh, 20 to 30 production offices and these are located uh, locally next to these suppliers. Uh, uh, these, uh, these production offices, they work uh, directly with the buyers in Sweden, which is H&M, and then they also work directly with the suppliers that are manufacturing their goods. Uh, the production offices, uh, they review samples, they check quality, and they choose uh, the right supplier. Uh, choosing the right supplier is very important to H&M. Uh, they, uh, they don't put all the emphasis on cost effectiveness like most uh, fashion retail uh, companies would. Instead, H&M uh, focuses on, uh, or they take all this into account. They take into account transportation times, uh, import quotas, and uh, the quality aspects for that particular job. Each, um, each supplier is chosen uh, based on a particular job, not uh, an all-encompassing. Uh, and uh, the production offices also, uh, they, uh, they inspect uh, throughput or output from the uh, suppliers. And this helps dramatic, or drastically uh, reduce lead times uh, in their supply chain. Uh, doing all this, the production offices are able to uh, facilitate seamless uh, collaboration between the two parties. Uh, now we're going to talk about the suppliers. So H&M does not actually own any of these uh, factories. They are all outsourced. Uh, all, this, all the uh, manufacturing is outsourced to these suppliers. Uh, uh, they pick the suppliers they want to work on based on uh, specific criteria. Um, well, number one, or probably almost the most important uh, criteria is uh, sustainability, which uh, comes back to H&M's uh, 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 belief statement and their, uh, their business model. H&M um, likes to follow uh, negotiating with their suppliers instead of just bargaining. Uh, bargaining uh, makes it seem like you're trying to take advantage of the supplier. Uh, for the low price, where H&M likes to uh, negotiate and get a mutual benefic mutually beneficial agreement uh, from each party. H&M um, keeps constant communication with these suppliers and, uh, and uh, they pay special attention to keeping these suppliers as long-term partners. So H&M has two different types of clothing that they, uh, broad types that they make. They have the fast fashion and their basic type of clothing. So fast fashion represents 30% of the clothing, and this, these suppliers are all in Europe. Uh, they have less lead times, and these are the more trendy clothing options and more expensive. The basics, which is, represents 70% of their clothing, these are the items with longer lead times, but they are the ones that are more cost effective, the ones that H&M gets a higher profit margin. So collaboration with suppliers. Approximately 20% of its suppliers are considered strategic partners. Um, and these, so roughly, 20% is roughly uh, about 180 to 200 of these suppliers in the 900. And they make up 20%, but they produce 50% of the good. H&M um, likes to keep a very close eye on these suppliers, these strategic partners. They perform uh, pretty heavy duty audits on them. Uh, roughly twice a year they produce these audits and uh, these audits are uh, very focused on I mean they, they try and just keep 
transparency. H&M want, wants to know what's going on in their factories. Um, I think it's mostly because the, they believe that they can't outsource responsibility, and if they want to keep up with all the uh, with all these mottos that they say they have with sustainability and that they're producing low-cost goods um, at a good price, and they are uh, they're not destroying the environment. So they, they can't. They have to make sure that these that these factories are keeping up with that. Uh, and so when they perform these audits, they look at they make sure that the, the factory is not having a child labor. There's no forced labor. These people are receiving at least the minimum wage, and uh, and they also, when they do these audits, they want they are very managerial focused. They want the manager to understand these concepts and to implement them in their factory. Uh, with these strategic partners, H and M has joint planning of up to five years, and that is uh, based on the rating H and M has with them, and uh, they'll sign they'll have up to a five year contract with them. So again, H uh, and M grades their suppliers, and they reward um, the better grade suppliers with more job or more contracts for uh, manufacturing and more jobs. H&M um, is nearly vertically integrated. Um, they with their, especially with their uh, with their suppliers, and they do this. A good example of this ver near vertical integration is with their strategic partners. Uh, they will come in and uh, set up a model factory for these suppliers. They'll show them how they can use less chemicals how they can be sustainable, how they can cut costs, and how they can do this and turn a profit. H&M um, likes to keep, they do this because they want these factories to, uh, to, to do this certain way. They, the sustainability aspect is again important. Um, these strategic partners receive uh, four visits a year to improve their sustainability practices, while the um, other suppliers that are not strategic partners, the other 80% uh, maybe receive three now I'm going to give it off to Matt, and he's going to talk more about the vertical integration. So as Jeff was saying, um, H&M has near vertical integration, and it's near vertical integration because they don't own the suppliers. However, um, as Jeff was saying, they audit their suppliers very heavily. Additionally, they audit uh, the second tier suppliers that their first tier suppliers use. Um, so they're very in control of the sustainability practices that are going on and the wages that are being done and the processes. Um, as a company, uh, they're looking for ways to cut costs, and that includes with their suppliers as well. Um, so they actually work with their suppliers for best practices. Uh, furthermore, um, H&M uh, does this to limited intermediaries, and this allows them to cut costs and speed up time um, in case they need to get a product out faster, which was mentioned with lead times. And uh, finally, uh, all of these practices allows H&M um, to outsource a considerable amount of its work, but still take control of its supply chain and bring, retain movement. Um, uh, so going from the supplier to obviously the transportation to get it to the warehouses, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, um, using the information from the production offices, uh, they outsource to transportation. Uh, their transportation is mainly consisted of shipping and rail. Um, this is because this is more environmentally friendly and also cheaper. Uh, they do not really use air, uh, but they do use trucking companies uh, to maintain their sustainable supply chain uh, and overall company motto. Um, they have a variety of different programs for their transportation systems, uh, specifically designed for trucking. They have a smart way program, uh, which is for the United States. It's run by the EPA, and it's an evaluation and certification um, system that evaluates the environmental impact that a trucking company has. In Europe, they work with the European Roundtable, um, which once again is another program uh, that's called Way Ahead that de determines and evaluates um, the environmental impact that a trucking company has. Uh, some of the standards that they look for is 70% of the uh, drivers have to be trained in fuel efficiency uh, methods, which means not mashing the gas, slow braking, trying to maintain a steady speed for optimum gas usage. Um, the trucks have to be less than 10 years old. And finally, the trucking companies have to have a CO2 reduction plan. Um, and in that plan, they have to have an action and a follow-up. And this is all to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, furthermore, since a lot of their work is done through clean shipping, 
Um, now through shipping, they use a, a program called Clean Shipping, which is a European program that monitors environmental performance of maritime transports. And what it does is it takes data and puts it into a database, and it creates an index that's used European, Europe-wide. Um, and this was a green initiative of the year in 2010. Um, so the transportation goes from, takes it from the suppliers um, to a warehouse where it's then distributed to the stores, uh, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, but they're called call-off warehouses because none of the stores have stock. Um, this is to keep high turnover um, and to be more efficient. Um, the goal of a centralized warehouse is so that they can have one warehouse in the region, the warehouses are regionalized, and they can distribute it to the respective stores. Um, a really big part here is their inter enterprise resource planning system, uh, which allows for rapid replenishment. Uh, and now from the distribution centers, which are regional, we get to the stores. Uh, all the stores have a uniform layout. Um, this has been proven to generate more sale. Um, and the big key takeaway from their stores is they have an electronic point of sale system, which connects the store floor to the stock room uh, which is in the distribution center, or at what we labeled the warehouse, which can then relay the information to the production facility, uh, which then can be relayed to the supplier. Um, and that just allows for a quick response supply chain. Um, because as soon as an item is purchased, it's sent all the way back. Uh, and that is also used to replenish the inventory of the store. Um, and finally, at the end of the supply chain, we have reverse logistics. So what happens when a customer um, returns unwanted clothing? Oh, uh, well, um, since they're a very sustainable uh, company, they actually have a program where they collect unwanted garments um, from any store and they recycle it. Uh, this, what this does is it improves their brand, um, but it also gives the person uh, the incentive uh, an in-store discount. Um, and finally, 20% uh, of their specific clothing line are made entirely from recyclables. Um, and we're just gonna go a little bit more into the process, is eventually they want their supply chain to look like this. Um, from the design, using product life management software and enterprise resource planning software, um, they're able to have a very agile and lean supply chain. Uh, eventually they want it to be a closed loop. Um, so, using the score analysis, as I just talked about, the full plan in, it originates and is designed in Sweden. Uh, they use fashion methods um, to accelerate the process of fashion so it can get to their suppliers faster. Um, their suppliers are their source, and in collaboration with the production offices, which are located nearby, um, the suppliers also make them. So, that's a combined efficiency which speeds up uh, lead times. And finally, they're delivered using a very sustainable and green transport system, uh, which they outsource. And finally, when it gets to the stores, uh, they can be returned. So some final thoughts is HMN's vertical integration has allowed it to follow its environmental initiative while still being cost effective. It clearly demonstrates that H&M's core competency lies in its fashion trend, but also in its supply chain. Um, and its success has led to approximate return on asset over three years of approximately 27%. Um, and its expected revenue growth uh, year over year is anywhere between five and 10%.